our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our sermon text today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2. Hear these words again. A wind from heaven came, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> tongues of fire. I didn't notice this to the end of first service. You just look at, up in this direction. You see the flames everywhere. You see them on me. You see them on the banner. And that idea of fire just kept going through my mind this week. What does it take to light a fire? I know a lot of you might have gone camping at one time, and I'm sure that's where the, the part that's missing out of our congregation is probably out camping right now on this great weekend. But that idea of what does it take to light a fire? You know, the easiest way to light a fire is, you know, if I have three lines in your bulletin, uh, metaphorically and actually, it's the best way to start a fire is with a fire. You know, matches, a lighter, sounds really easy. And I remember when I was much, much younger, I had a lot more hair, I was a little bit more involved, and I used to go camping. I used to go camping with some of my buddies, and we like to really camp. Not some of this camping that some of you might do. No offense, but camping isn't where you have an RV and you pull up and you have this machine level your RV out to its level. Or it's not where you open your refrigerator and there's cold beverages in there. Or you want heat or air conditioning, you simply switch the switch on the wall and make sure the satellite's just that's not camping. Okay? <laughs> Sorry, that's just a mobile motel that is not camping. Camping is where you go with your family or your buddies, and you have whatever you can carry. You go into the woods, away from your vehicle, and hike for hours with nothing but what's on your back. See, that's really camping. When I was younger, I used to do that all the time. I remember this was up in Ohio, and we went to this place called Hinkley Bluffs, and we loved it because there was these high bluffs, and you could climb up them in the daylight and then camp out on them at night. And I remember going in this April uh, weekend with some of my buddies, and we go up there, and there's five of us, and we get up to the top of these bluffs, it's just scenic, but it's really windy. It's really windy, and what we didn't realize is as the sun starts to go down, it starts to get cold. So what do we want to do? But well, we want to build fires. So we gather trees and sticks and branches, and we build a nice little fire ring, and we get all ready, and we sit down, and there's four out of the five of us are there together. And we look at each other and it's like, okay, let's start this fire. Okay, who brought the matches? Right? Now y'all laughing. This is way before Discovery Channel. Way before you had all these channels to teach how to, to, to light fires and all this. So we got there we're just staring at each other like, you didn't bring matches? It's getting cold. You know, it's almost starting to have a little flurries. It's getting cold up here. The wind's blowing and I can't climb down these rocks in the middle of the night. What are we going to do? So we're just sitting there, staring at this fire. Of course, we might take a few sticks and try to rub them together, but if you've ever done that, it really doesn't work. Your hands get tired. You do the little spin, you know, like you're Mr. Miyagi, and you spin the little stick. No, it doesn't work. You can't start a fire just by wishing. But you can start a fire with another fire. See, our disciples are basically in the same place. Starting a fire is something you can think about, but actually doing it is something else. Starting a fire is really easy on paper, but actually doing it with your own two hands is an incredible feat. Our disciples had just walked with Jesus. They seen his fire of the Spirit as he walked among the people. They've seen that fire as they walked alongside him for three and a half years, seeing all the miracles he did, how people were coming to faith by him just simply talking to them. See, that's that fire of the Spirit that the disciples, the lay people, were hoping for. They saw their Savior die. They saw him rise from the dead, and then he came to them. They were in fear, not realizing they had a fire in them. They hid in the upper room. Feared for the lives they hid, 
and Jesus came to them and breathed the Spirit on them. And that's not what today is about. Today is about Pentecost, which is another occurrence. He breathed on the twelve, and then they still didn't know what to do. Because if we read through the Gospels, what did they do? They went and hid some more the next week. And then they went and they went fishing when they're supposed to be reaching people. For 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, he continued to come to them, continued to say, get out of the boat. <clears throat> he continued to say, you're supposed to be reaching the lost. You remember those lines, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. You know, all these references, over and over, he's telling the disciples, it is that time. Last week we heard of the ascension. They're all in the field looking up. Jesus is raised up with two angels appearing and saying, what are you doing? He's going to come back. Get to work. Do something. See, that's what's encouraging but kind of scary. So they go back to Jerusalem because Jesus said, go to Jerusalem. I'll send that helper to help you. So they all go back to Jerusalem. Not just the eleven. Not just the twelve with the new one that was added, but 120. See, that's what's special about this text. And what's special about today is, I don't know yet, if we can, how many people in this room don't do it. We probably have close to 120 right now. This is the number that was in that room. This is the number in Acts 2. They go to this upper room, it may be the same one they had the last supper, but it is an upper room, and they go there and await a gift. Something like the wind blows from heaven in on them, and they see something that looks like the flames of the Spirit over each of their heads, calling to them. To me, it was so incredible to think about 120, just what we have here. If I were to ask you before today, could 120 people change the world? What would you think? Could 120 20 people change the world. See, that's what's so special about today, that idea of Pentecost, where God gives them this gift. Jesus says, I have to leave so that you can receive this gift, where that life will be breathed into you. You see, that life is in each of us. That light, that fire, that burned in those disciples, that burned in these 120 people, is in us. We just got to stoke it. We just got to blow on it. We got to get those ambers hot again. See, that's where I see Hanover being taken. I see us right now poised. We're right on the edge. I can see God moving this church. But the key is we have to open our mouths. The key is we have to go out and actually say something to our neighbors. I will guarantee each of you to go home today and think of someone that doesn't have a church home. I'll guarantee each of you have someone in your life who doesn't know the love of Christ, who doesn't have a church home. And that's what this is all about. How God's calling to us to use those words, to use our breath to reach those that are lost, to reach those that don't have a church home, that might have heard of Christ, maybe knows who he is, but they've fallen away. The problem is we get complacent. We're like those disciples, we're like those 120. We want to stay in the boat and just fish. But God's calling us to do more. He's calling us through these words to open our mouths. We have a box of brochures you can hand out. It's another way to help you stoke that fire. Another way to encourage others to come. You know, the ladies I talked to this week about this issue on Wednesday morning, I, I said, you know, what, why did you get to do this? And they're like, we don't know what to say. And a simple word would be, where is your church home? Do you have a church home? A phrase like that is so welcoming. Because when they say, no, I really don't have a church home, what do you think your response should be? Well, why don't you come try to handle it? Why do you come to where I hear the word of God you're welcome to join me. See, that's the best opening there is. Do you have a church home? Give them that opportunity to open their mouths. See, that's what God called to these 120. These weren't the disciples. These 120 were you. These 120 were you 
called by God. You call to open your mouth to breathe that life into others that don't have hope. See, that's why we're here. We're here because we already have the hope. The hope in our Savior, the hope in that flame, that fire of our life. See, I'm going to take you back to that bluff. Back to that mountaintop. There was four of us there with no idea of what to do. The fifth member of our group showed back up after he was gathering some more twigs and branches. And we looked at him and said, do you have any way to start this fire? And he said, I don't have any matches, but I have a transistor radio. One of them old little ones with a 9-volt battery. And he goes, and I have some steel wool. So I scrapped a pot. And of course, we all looked at him like he was crazy. Steel wool and a 9-volt battery. What are you going to do with that? He simply held them together and blew it. And you would be amazed at the flame that it creates. Through something you would not expect, through his breath, he made that fire warm. It weren't all night long. See, that's what God's doing to us. He's going to take each of you that you don't expect to be used. You can't see how God's going to use you. And through that breath, he will bring you life. Through that breath, he puts that fire in you. Through that breath, you'll be able to reach someone out there that has no hope. They're in your life right now. You just gotta open your eyes. They're in your life right now, and we're called by God to be that fire. My prayer for you this week is that God will ignite you. That God will throw, blow that spirit into you. Breathe on you that spirit so that you too, and me also, can just find one more. One more for Christ. Because you know what? Somebody found me. And that's my Savior. May the peace of God that transcends all understanding fill you with that fire, light you a fire in Him. Amen. Please stand as we continue with the nice and free. I believe in one God. Friendship, the booklet at the end of each child. I use this for my personal purpose. 